One, two, one, mic check. Yeah, we're good. Nahao miigwech, nindinoi maganaduk. Thanks for tuning in. This is Stories from the Land. Rainy Lake. It sits in the heart of Treaty 3 territory in northwestern Ontario. Guchichi Zegei Gun is in the heart of Anishinaabe Aki, the words used by the local Anishinaabe peoples to describe this place. It's a place with rugged beauty, unrelenting sunsets, and a humble way about it. Early explorers, treaty commissioners, and settlers all marveled at the bounty of the Rainy Lake Territory in northwestern Ontario. From the bountiful wild rice, big game, and of course, the fish. It was noted that the bounty and the promise of this place was a heaven on earth for settlers to begin life anew. They say indigenous people have called this place home since time immemorial. It makes sense. Everything you need to live a good life is here. There was the promise of a good life here for those that were brave enough to call this place home. The Tucker family is one of those families brave enough to call this place home. In fact, they've called this place home since before Canada was even a country. Their ancestors all that time ago embraced the promise of this place and created a good life here. Today, they are fighting to hold on to that way of life on the lake where fishing is at the center. like being up the lake and that way since I was a kid. I'm always looking forward to get up there. <laughs> I don't care for down, I never have. Like I love where I live at, in town too, but you can only stay for so long. Like we don't usually stay four days in town. <laughs> in town, we get really uh, stressed out, eh? Because we're not town people, like we're, this is where we are most of the time and you get used to it, eh? It's not saying we don't like being around there, but we'd rather be in the quiet and even in the winter, we're the same way. It doesn't take us long to get out of there, you know, get up the lake. You want to know something? This world, to us, is more, well, to me anyway, is it's peaceful. Like, I'm more comfortable up here than I am in town. And that's awful to say, but I am. You know, because this is our home. Yeah. It's always like coming home because it is home. Now I'm in the third generation, and hopefully my son will carry it on. It was my, my grandfather, George Tucker, who bought it originally. And then from him, it went to my father, Gib Tucker, then from him, it went to me. This is a nice day to set a net. I've been doing this all my life, and I'm just a few months short of 70. I've been fishing with a boat by myself probably since I was about 12. Back then you didn't have to have boat license. We still train young pe our young people young to run a boat. They got to know how to run their equipment too. Yeah, you work every day and there's no days off. Just like a farmer, he goes work every day. So it, it feels sometimes like, uh, like yeah, why are you doing it? I do it because I, I like doing it. This is for me, yeah. It's just being closer to nature and something I enjoy doing. Fish move. Like, they might be in this spot for a week and they might move over here 100 yards. So you've got to follow them. you got to move your net. You can't leave them in the same place all summer. There's always tomorrow, you, if you're fishing, you, you don't catch fish every day. Uh, you'll catch some fish, but not a lot of fish. But maybe one or two days down the line, you'll catch a lot of fish. Every day is not the same. Every day is different. It is hard work, but it's, it's a good life. It's a, a job that you can't take lightly because you gotta be here every day. You gotta be ready for that. You can't 
quit if the weather gets bad or cold or if there's no fish. I've seen years where there's no fish and you fish hard to, to get your fish. Like right now, there's a fair amount of fish. They go in cycles. It's a good way to, to make a living. Nobody bothers you out here. You're out in the fresh air, nice scenery. It's a lot better than working in town as far as I'm concerned. If you were to say the name Brian Tucker to anyone that knows anything about Rainy Lake, they'd go, oh yeah, he's a fisherman. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And when I said to him, well, maybe, Brian, you and I could jump in the boat and just throw rod and jig, he no. said, hey, I would never do Why? I fish enough. <laughs> During the ice, ice time, when we're ice fishing, he will drop a rod every once in a while. Not very often, maybe once or twice a winter. But I've been out there with him lots, and he sings. Like he's humming and singing away. Like he, he, he really enjoys it out there. And you got the pelicans sneaking up and then he always takes a dog with him. One of the dogs are always in the boat fishing. Eh? Sunny's starting to stay home a little bit more, but now this new one will learn if she's quit falling out of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Blaine Tucker's camp has been established on this lake for over a hundred years. He's the only other commercial fisherman actively fishing on this lake. The lake is over 900 square kilometers in size. That's over 220,000 acres of lake. My name's uh, Blaine Tucker. I'm from Fort Francis, Ontario. Brian Tucker's dad was Gibb, and that was my dad's brother. And Brian, so Brian's my cousin. I've been commercial fishing here probably 50 years. My grandfather was the one of the people that got me started in the fishery and my dad. My dad kind of took it over from my grandfather and we've been here for a long time. <laughs> Things got tough here when uh, the MNR came in and bought all the fisheries out. They took all our walleye quarters away. So, and they just give us little weak walleye quarters back. Like, I, I'm, I'm the only one on the whole lake that's got a walleye coat, and it's so small that, uh, like, if I wanted to go out there and fish walleyes, just walleyes, I could catch it in three days. They won't give us any, any quota. They say they, don't, they want commercial fishermen to catch no walleye. So how can you run a commercial fishery if you don't catch a walleye? That's the money fish. Over the years, a large number of commercial fishing licenses have been bought out or transferred. This has significantly reduced the overall number of active fishermen on the lake. There are now only two. Well, I'm just looking at some pictures from when we got married and the old times. It's not just a business. Like our kids come, our grandkids come, it's home. They, they love it as much as we do. They're gonna take over one day and then we'll get to watch them do it. <laughs> well, my mom, like she went to school at the residential school. Eh? She couldn't wait to get away from here. And a lot of our people don't talk about the residential school because they've lost so much of their family, eh? The, t the closeness, eh? They were only allowed, to, I think, to go home once a year at Christmas time and just for the day. Like they know their families love them, but it's, it's hard, eh, because the residential schools tried to change them, and it hurt a lot of the bar people. My mom was one of them. There's not a weekend that goes by if someone isn't up here that you get to visit with your family, eh, because it's important to stay close to your family. It's Brian. That was on our wedding day. It was a beautiful day we had. After we got married, the eagles were squawking and flying over us. It was nice. Must have been saying it was okay, I guess. On Rainy Lake in northwestern Ontario, 
a way of life that has been operating for generations is quietly coming to an end. Commercial fisheries on the lake have always been a sustainable industry and once upon a time, they flourished. Years ago, there was way more fishermen than four. There was probably, I'm not exactly sure how many, but there was quite a few. On the north arm here, there was probably 10 or 12. We actually bought out a couple of the other fishermen's licenses, but we didn't buy them out. We got them from the MNR because they give them up or whatever. All the other three licenses, they're just whitefish licenses. That's all they can fish. Whereas I can fish all the fish. I don't have big quotas, but I didn't sell my licenses out. So I got all my fish. I can catch anything. Here goes Don, her brother, Donnie Howells. I thought X was in one of them too. That might be, might be X there. I don't know who's taking the pictures up there. That's uh, Flappy, we call him. I forget his, he used to come up all the time. There's Carl, that's all your brother. All nicknames. Yeah. 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 I didn't even recognize Flappy. Recognize him because of his bald head. <laughs> <laughs> this was me here. That's my son Charlie up there. He was quite a bit younger. He, so did Dad have the fishery then? Mm, nope, I had it. You had it? Yeah. That's what it's all about up here, is all the memories, family and memories. To say that running a one-person fishing operation is hard work would be an understatement. It's long days followed by longer days. But for these two men, it's a way to make an honest living. So what time do you usually try to get out at the, get out on the lake by? The earlier the better. I usually try and get out by six. Depends on if I have to, like I need a lot of fish, then I'll lift my nets again in the evening. I go back out about four o'clock and lift them again. And then I go back out the next morning and you know, that's how way it works. One essential part of any fishing operation is ice. Harvested from the lake in the spring and stored all year to help keep the fish cold. Putting up ice, as it's called, is an annual tradition that keeps fisheries and their ice sheds stocked for the entire year. See how cool it is in there? Oh my goodness. These are blocks you cut out from the ice out there and you drag them in here, how long will this lake ice last for you? As long as I don't open the door too much and stuff, and uh, that'll be here till I'll have to throw some out next fall. This is the kind of the hottest part of the summer and you got, you got tons of ice. So what, what kind of building is this here? It's a truck body. Uh, they used to haul frozen pizzas in this. When you've been doing this as long as these guys, you learn a thing or two and you've seen it all. And there's a lot of people that they don't like commercial fishermen. It's just they don't like us, so whatever. Why is that? Taking all the fish. They figure we're taking all the fish on them. I have lost whitefish nets, whole whole gangs of them, like four four nets at a time. And O'Brien lost some nets up there too. A couple of years ago, he lost nets. So I don't know what they do with them. I think uh, we only take uh, four percent of the walleye out of the lake. That's all. Yeah, but there's people, they, they'll go and they'll, I don't know why they cut them up, but uh, get the, take the fish out of them or what? But. If someone's out here mad at you because you're setting a net and they think that the reason they're not catching fish on a fishing rod is because of Blaine Tucker, well, they're out to lunch as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure they are too, but <laughs> yeah, they can't get it through their head. Whatever. Maybe maybe change your hook, <laughs> yeah. maybe yeah. find a different reef. Uh, That's right, yeah. Maybe stay home. Yeah. Yeah. Come and buy some from me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you might know a guy that has some walleye in the boat, eh? Yeah. 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 <laughs> With a lake full of fish and only a few commercial licenses putting a small amount of pressure on the sports fish, it begs the question, how does one get into this industry? There's four current commercial licenses there. Mm -hmm. Can a, can a guy apply for one? And no, you would have to buy somebody out, and then the government has to approve you buying it. 
to have a commercial license, you've got to go out when, when you can fish and, and catch your fish and get it over with. You can't just have a license to donate fish to the band or stuff like that, and you can't afford it. My son will take over after I, and if he couldn't for some reason, uh, give my brother, he has sons, I'm sure one of them would, just to keep the fish from going, because uh, the whole family helps keep it going, like we all get together and put up the ice. We just didn't get a fish. Well, last week put the net in and we got enough to feed us and fill the smokehouse. And I put it in at six o'clock in the morning. I left it at six o'clock at night. But that gives you 12 hours, your net's in the water. Like our net was in the water for three hours. The reason we only could leave it in for three hours today is Lynn had a phone call for an emergency doctor appointment. So we have to go to town here right after lunch. We didn't even plan on going into town today. So that changed the whole setup. I mean, we had to pull the net out. But her health is more important than us staying and trying to catch fish. I got a few fish. I got one nice big northern. He's uh, not real big, but he's a fish. And got. I don't know. Well, I don't know how many. Two. Three. Got about five or six out of the walleye. That's the money fish. These here, fish here were probably, they're probably five pounds here, so you have probably $50. I. I do have a kind of a, like, I think I, I'm kind of at the point where I should keep it, like I want to keep it going. I don't want it uh, to go to somebody else or I don't want to sell it back to the government or whatever, but I'm getting old now and I just, I don't know what's going to happen with it. Like my son, he don't really want it. He's got a job and, and I don't know. Don't know what's going to happen yet. A few more years down the road, we'll find out. I'll party fish at least another eight years if I can, if my health holds out. And by that time, my granddaughters are going to be, maybe my, one of my granddaughters might want it. My son, he might too later on. He's, he's got a good job now, but we'll see. He knows it's there. Well, I really don't want to sell it, so. Like the sad part is there, whoever takes over after me, like I've been lucky I can make my living off it. And I still had to go when I was younger, I still had to go to work in the bush someplace. And whoever does it, takes over after me, you have to do the same thing, have to have a, an off season job. Because uh, like my father, he could make a living off a year round because they allowed them to catch more fish. And, but now they don't do that. And it's hard, the markets are hard now. Like if there's not enough fish, fishermen fishing, they won't send trucks for them. So that's the big thing. When I can't do it no more, that's when I'll stop. When, uh, when I can't lift fish boxes and stuff like that, but then, then it'll be time to stop. But right now I can still lift box fish. And so I'm still going ahead with it. I think I can still do it for a couple more years, I hope. In its heyday, close to 30 commercial fishing operations were operating on Rainy Lake. Rainy Lake walleye is the stuff of legend. Suffice to say that these days may be behind us. 
today, there are just four licenses left on the lake. But why? When you talk to the fishermen on the lake, they all claim how healthy the fishing population on the lake is. Never been better, most say. Some have the opinion that putting tourism and sports fishing ahead of commercial fishing is better for the area. Others speculate that it's just too expensive to have the Ministry of Natural Resources follow the ups and downs of these small fisheries. And yet others say, commercial fishing and sports fishing just don't mix. Which, history tells us, that on Rainy Lake isn't true. Over a century ago, Blaine Tucker's grandfather built a small one-room log cabin here on the south arm of Rainy Lake. The fishery has been in existence longer than Canada has. It's unfathomable that this small, ethical, and sustainable fishery may not have a future given the current market conditions due to COVID, not to mention the fact that there seems to be a number of outside forces that are determined to ensure that these men are the last fishermen on Rainy Lake. Brian and Lynn Tucker have committed their lives to sustaining themselves in connection to the land and to the water. They've raised their families here on Rainy Lake. While the fishery's future may be in question, their resolve is not. Family, that is what life is all about for Lynn and Brian. And that is something no fish quota can ever take away. <laughs>